good afternoon. Uh, as always, it's an enormous pleasure to come to Ireland. I think I come at least once per year nowadays, uh, very often to lecture to, through to the Institute of Physics and other, other things, and it's always a great pleasure. I get extremely warm welcome. I'm going to go very fast today uh, through the whole history of modern cosmology uh, and bring us right up to date uh, with the uh, results of the, uh, of, the, of the Planck satellite, which you will all have heard about. Uh, I think from the point of view of teaching and, and young people, again, this is a very inspirational topic. And in addition, there are so many lessons that you can learn about how science actually works. There's what you teach them in the classroom, and then there's what we actually do. And as you know, these are very different, different processes. But it's this mix of trial and error, making mistakes, getting the right answer, making breakthroughs that it's all about. So there, we start at the very beginning with the early speculative cosmologies from Descartes and Wright. And these, again, were not really supported by any observational evidence. They were sort of ideas about how, what the structure of the universe uh, might look like. I like this one by, by Kant, which shows a hierarchical universe. You, can, you would call it a fractal universe now, which is, well, in some sense, not too far wrong. But you can see, again, in this picture by, uh, by, by Kant from a, a long time ago. Um, again, the, the things began to become more quantitative uh, with, uh, with William Herschel, and this is his picture of his map of the universe, and this was all on the basis of simply counting the number of stars in different directions. Assume they all have then the same intrinsic brightness, and then you can work out what the shape of all the observable stars are. But the work uh, was brilliant for its time, Obviously, the assumption that they all have the stars of the same luminosity is not correct. And of course, interstellar dust, the extinction, it wasn't known at that time. But it was, again, the pioneering work. Now, again, one of the great things, which is not far from you here, is the wonderful uh, telescope at Burr Castle. I'm, I assume you take the young people there all the time because it really is an, a most wonderful, a wonderful thing. Uh, Lord Ross then built the largest telescope uh, in the world at its time at Burr Castle. Not perhaps the best observing site in the world. <coughs> Not necessarily the best observing site in the world. Uh, but what we do credit him with is the discovery of the spiral structure in the nebulae, which I don't know if you've seen the wonderful drawings that he did, made by hand on pencil and pencil and paper by obs observations through that. That picture on the, on the right is again uh, one of the original drawings by Ross and, and, and his team. Now, the, uh, the great development in the mid-19th century was the ability to build larger telescopes, in particular the development of the reflecting telescope, uh, which required much higher precision technology to be able to track points on the sky. And with that, um, Keeler, for example, when he was commissioning the Crossley reflector, obtained the same picture of M31. The previous picture, again, was, was Ross's picture. There's Ross's picture. Ross did pretty well in, in, in getting it right. But the picture by uh, Crossley, again, showed the spiral structure that we know and also obtained many spectacular images of fainter spiral galaxies. This led to uh, what is called the Great Debate. It wasn't actually all that great a debate, in fact. In fact, it wasn't a debate at all. It was just a, a sort of messed up discussion that took place. But the issue is at stake were very important. And they were concerned the issue of what actually is the size of our galaxy. And secondly, are the spiral nebulae galactic or extra galactic objects? There were two uh, opposing points of view. If you simply did what William Herschel did and count the numbers of stars, which is what Captain did in, in his 1921 uh, paper, then you would have the sun located rather close to the center of the system of the stars. On the other hand, uh, what uh, Shapley did was to look at the globular clusters. These are objects which avoid the plane of the galaxy but go uh, in a much more extended distribution throughout the, the galaxy. And if you do that, then you find that the sun is very much at the edge of a very much larger system. So this was the question. What is the real size of the galaxy and what's the nature of the spiral nebulae? Well, uh, we heard in, in Paul's talk this morning about the Cepheid variable stars, which were, again, discovered in part of the great Harvard surveys. 
They've got a very characteristic light curve, so the light goes up very rapidly and then decre decreases less rapidly, which is a very characteristic signature of these, these stars. Well, the great work uh, was on this was done by Henriette uh, Leavitt, uh, who, who was deaf and born in Dundee, as I was, <laughs> in, in, in Scotland. And her major contribution uh, was to calibrate the magnitude scales on the photographs taken by the great Harvard surveys. But she was also asked to look at the Magellanic clouds and look at catalog all the variable stars. She identified the Cepheids and came up with this wonderful correlation uh, between the period of the oscillation of the star and also its luminosity. So that the most luminous stars are the ones which have got longer periods. And as Paul explained to you, once you've got something like that, where you can identify the absolute luminosity of the, of the object, then by measuring its apparent brightness, you get this distance. And this is absolutely key a uh, part of the astronomical story. Well, this was taken up by, by Hubble, who used the Cepheid variable techniques to show that M31, our, our nearest neighbor spiral galaxy, is indeed outside the galaxy. And that was one of, the, one of the very substantial breakthroughs. It has to be said that most people generally thought they were extragalactic by then, because there was other evidence uh, basically on, on Novae and so forth that that had to be the case. But the work on the Cepheid variables really was the clincher. Now, as soon as he'd done that, then he presented this remarkable paper in the next year on galaxies as extragalactic systems. And I find this a very, very impressive and not nearly as well-known paper as the other one, because what he did uh, was the following. He introduced the morphological classification of galaxies, that is the division between the elliptical galaxies, the ordinary spiral galaxies, and the barred spiral galaxies. Um, and then worked out the statistics for all of these types of galaxies. Made estimates of the numbers of different types. Also estimated this thing, the mass to luminosity ratio that Paul again mentioned this morning, which is very important on the basis of the light and the, uh, of the objects. And then from that was able to work out the mean mass density of the universe, all in this paper of 1926. So it's a very, very impressive uh, rapid development of our understanding of cosmology. Now, let's uh, just uh, look then at the first self-consistent cosmological models. Until Einstein discovered the general theory of relativity, there were no complete self-consistent models of the universe as a whole. And that's because you, you cannot get satisfy the boundary conditions in Newtonian gravity at infinity in a satisfactory way. But once you've got general relativity, you've got the way of, of, the, of building completely self-consistent models for the universe as a whole. And that was what Einstein set about doing in 1917, once he'd completed uh, general relativity. Now, as was already, uh, uh, let, let, let's therefore now uh, summarize uh, what uh, Einstein did. Now, this is my two-slide summary of everything you need to know about special relativity and general relativity. Oh, uh, so we will do a special relativity first. So what does special relativity tell you? Now, you should tell the, you should tell the young people this. Right? This, this, will, this will get you lots of brownie points. Right? There's only two things you need to know. Uh, first of all, we live in space-time, <laughs> not in space and time. We live in space-time. And every time I give this lecture and I use the word space-time, everybody remembers that ever after. Right? I had students that I taught in 1976, Malcolm, I remember you saying space-time. And, right, and once you've got the idea that we live in this four-dimensional universe rather than a three plus one universe, uh, then everything topples out. So, that realization, once you then apply it not only to kinematics but then to the dynamics, that's what leads to E equals MC squared. So again, there's this, this causal link through them, the, through, the, through the fundamental theory that gives you that result. So you now know everything you need to know about special relativity. So let's now do general relativity. So, so here's what you need to know about general relativity. And that is matter bends spacetime. Now, notice the key thing, it's bending space-time. It's not bending just space, and it's not bending just time. It's the four-dimensional manifold that you're working in that is getting bent by the presence of matter. It's gravity acting on space-time. 
So that's the first part of the story. Then the matter moves along paths in bent space-time. Right? So you, you, you bend the space-time and then the trajectory of the particles are determined by that bent space-time. And so what you have to do is to get a theory which produces a self-consistent story of making these two features of the theory hang together. And that's why it's a wee bit complicated to, uh, to put all of this together. But that was Einstein's really fantastic achievement uh, in, in, 19, in 1915. So that's the theory that, that, that he used. So, as I said, uh, he realized he then had the tools to build self-consistent models of the whole universe. But, again, at that stage, the expansion of the universe had not been discovered, and Einstein said himself, there are very, very small velocities of the, of, the, of the stars about us, and therefore we've got to get a static universe. So, what do we do? What did he do? He did, he introduced the cosmological constant as a term which was appears as a constant in the solution of the field equations, but which you set equal to zero if you're doing local general relativity. But you don't have to put it equal to zero. If you just leave it in, then you get this thing called the cosmological constant. Now, what he essentially did then, doing this diagrammatically, we're going to represent the whole universe by just taking a sphere about ourselves with a galaxy at the edge of that sphere, and that acts as a model for the dynamics and kinematics of the whole universe. So what would happen if you had none of opposing force is gravity would make that sphere collapse. And that's bad news. You want the universe to exist. So the effect of keeping in that cosmological constant is to have a repulsive force, if you like, which then ends up with this balanced system. And so that is the content of Einstein's model of uh, 1917. And it had the effect, once you run through this, this through general relativity, you end up with a closed finite universe with all the boundary conditions properly <coughs> taken care of. Nowadays, we can rewrite this cosmological constant in terms of a dark energy or negative pressure equation of state. So if you just assume that uh, in addition to the normal components of the universe, we've got this dark energy pressure present, and it's got this equation of state P equals minus rho C squared. Notice a minus one, that's the key thing. And you run it through the formalities of the models, you get exactly the cosmological constant. So that's why we can either think in terms of either this term appears on the right-hand side, in which case it's a dynamical field, or it appears on the left-hand side, in which case it's a modification of the geometry. So these are the sorts of things that one's going to wrestle about in understanding what's going on. <coughs> now, then Friedman, who got access to Einstein's papers only in 1920, uh, after the Russian Revolution and the Civil War had died down, they started working with his colleagues. He was a meteorologist rather than a, a cosmologist, but a brilliant mathematician. He then solved, in St. Petersburg, the dynamical models of the universe, which are the standard ones today. He, he worked out the closed models, the open models, and the, and the, and the geometrically flat models. So that was done by, by Friedman. And I always refer to these as the Friedman world models. So to get the complete picture then, uh, what you need is the following. You've got a gen these models of Friedman are, in are indeed expanding universes, although the expansion of the universe hadn't been discovered at that stage. But what it meant was that your model of the universe then looks like this. You're allowed to have some uniform expansion at some velocity v, but then that is being decelerated by gravity and you're also being repelled by the cosmological constant. So that picture there, which I think is entirely accessible to young people, encapsulates the whole of the way in which the overall infrastructure of the modern cosmological models work. You can use that model uh, and, and be quite happy you're not misleading them. So that's the way that you can think of the way that the models of the universe work. Now, let's, f for the moment, put lambda equal to zero, because there's some important things we need to do historically before we bring lambda back. Let's throw out lambda just for the moment. 
If you look at these models, then the behavior of the models only depends upon the average density of the matter in the universe. If you've got a high density universe, then you will decelerate the galaxies and they will come and back and collapse again on themselves. If you've got a low density universe, it, you will be exceeding the escape velocity and the models will carry on to infinity. So there is this critical density which separates the ever-expanding from those which will collapse again to a singularity, to a, to a big crunch. And these are, the, uh, these are the, again, the, the dynamics of these models. The critical model has been labeled omega naught equals one. Omega is the thing called the density parameter, where we just normalize all densities to this critical density here. But you can see here we've got an empty model where it just goes on forever. Here we've got one which collapses again, and here's the, the Einstein decision or the critical model, and that's the model which expands at the beginning, and gets larger and larger and larger and larger and larger and larger and gets to infinity and stops. So it's just the perfect analogy of escape velocity for the universe from its own gravity. Now, a great deal of attention has been attra uh, attracted by this model here, the critical one, uh, which just expands to infinity as a reference model. Now, then in 1929, uh, Hubble discovered uh, the velocity-distance relationship for galaxies. Uh, this is the original one that was published, and you can see it's a pretty crummy diagram. <laughs> that, in fact, all of the velocities were measured by Slipher um, and used then by Hubble. What Hubble did was to make the crude estimates of the distances of these stars using things like assuming the brightest stars all had the same uh, brightnesses in galaxies and so forth. And also, uh, you'll notice that the velocities are quite small. And in fact, we know random velocities might have messed up the hood, but he was lucky. And of course, in science, you need luck, right? Luck plays a huge part in this whole thing. He was lucky and he got the right answer. But also, uh, we know that he had a lot more velocities up his sleeve in his back pocket because within a few years, he and Humerson had actually extended the relationship and it's absolutely unambiguous that they had got, it, got indeed the right answer. The velocity is going up to around about 7% the speed, speed of light. So uh, that was the discovery of the, of the expansion of the, of the whole system of a system of galaxies. Now, in 1932... Einstein and the Sitter emphasized this, the unique nature of this, um, this model with the flat uh, space spatial sections, lambda equals zero, omega naught equals one. And that's often called the Einstein de Sitter or the critical model. And that only depends on the knowledge of Hubble's constant. So if you put in the values, you find out this is the value of the critical density in kilograms per, per meter cube. This figure was much greater than the value which had been derived by Hubble in his great paper of 1926. And so uh, Einstein and de Sitter, both theorists, say, ah, oh, but there may well be missing matter in the universe. There might be dark matter in the universe. And that was in the original paper of Einstein and de Sitter, arguing that it might be there. Well, as Paul t -t told you this morning, it wasn't long before Fritz Vicky came along and, and indeed was able to measure the mass of the coma cluster of galaxies. This is the picture of the coma cluster here. And what he found was that the ratio of the mass to light for the coma cluster, once he'd measured the radial velocities of the galaxies in the cluster, was about 500 for the whole cluster compared with about three for our own galaxy. So it meant there must be much more mass present which was not emitting a visible light. So most of the mass in the cluster has to be invisible, and all the studies of galaxies since that time have absolutely confirmed that result. So this is the first period of what I would call modern dark matter. At this stage, it was perfectly possible all of that matter could be ordinary baryonic matter, ordinary stuff that you and I are made of. At that stage, it wasn't necessary to suppose it was some exotic form. It could have been, for example, planets. It could be something that did not emit in the optical wave band. So there were lots of possibilities. But the other thing which, which again, Paul mentioned was uh, how you can work out the age of the universe. And we use Paul's formula. Just take one over the Hubble constant. And, and at that time, if you used the best value from Hubble, it was about 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which would correspond to the age of the universe of 2 billion years. And that is bad news. 
because even at that time, people knew that the age of the Earth was 4.6 billion years. Fortunately, of course, we've got clever people around, and among these were Arthur Eddington and the Abbé Lemaitre. And they realised if they kept the lambda term back in, you solve the problem because the lambda term stretches out all the time scales because you've changed the dynamics from the simple model. And in Eddington's words, what he said, the universe would then have a logarithmic infinity to fall back on. You could actually make it infinitely aged if you chose the lambda term correctly. So lambda came back into fashion. And here's what happens. This is just taking a model with a, with a flat section, so I've got these things equal to one. And so here you see the, uh, the standard model, this is the Einstein decision model. But if you now keep cranking down the mass uh, contribution and building up the lambda contribution, you move progressively down here. So you've got these models, which have got this type of dynamics. Eventually, you hit the exponential expansion under the lambda term. And so here is one over h naught here. And so this is why you've got, uh, you've got bad news here for this model, uh, for, the, for the argument. But if you put in the lambda term, you can get as long time scales as you want, if you choose it correctly. Now, the other thing which happened about this time were the arguments about the origin of the chemical elements. Um, there were two arguments in the 1930s that favored a primordial origin, origin for the chemical arguments. First of all, there was the uniformity of the chemical abundances of the elements in stars. Wherever you looked to a first approximation, not to a second, but to a first approximation, the chemical abundances were more or less the same. This is some of the great work uh, that, that was done in the 1920s, Milne and, uh, and, 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 uh, and Pe Pepin, Kapushkin and others. The secondly, at that stage, it was not believed that the cores of stars would be hot enough to actually synthesize the, the elements. And so uh, th this is because one, is, one made the simple assumption that you had to ha get up to the, the rest mass energy, the mass difference, to make it work. In fact, as we now know, that's not correct. But Georges Lemaitre then proposed the initial state of the Friedman models was going to consist of a what he called a primeval atom, and following the discovery of the neutron in 1932, then that was identified with a sea of neutrons. <clears throat> now, after the war, George Gamow uh, found that the time scale for the early expansion of the universe was far too short for the equilibrium abundances of the elements to be set up. In other words, if you take the standard world models, they expand very, very rapidly, and you would never actually set up an equilibrium uh, uh, distribution of the elements. So in this period from 1946 to 1950, he, Alfred Fallon and Herman, Fermi and Turkovich, they established uh, the following facts about primordial nucleosynthesis. The first one was that the heavy elements were created in extremely small quantities, but around about 25% of the protons were converted into helium. At that stage, that was just an observation. There was no way of, at that point, in being able to confront that with observations. And secondly, that there should be a background radiation in the universe with temperature about five degrees, the, the cooled relic of the very early stages of the universe. Now, note the dates. This has all happened by 1950. Now, the interesting thing is that this got forgotten. And part of the reason for that was that just after the war, there were many there were many conflicting theories about uh, the cosmological models. Things that were in the air were Milne's kinematic cosmology, where you distinguish between kinematic time and electrodynamic time. We've got Dirac's theory of large number of coincidences leading to a variable gravitational constant. There was Eddington's fundamental theory that he was working out. And then there was steady state cosmology. All of these things came, came, came to the fore immediately after the war. And it was in that atmosphere that these predictions were more or less forgotten. There was a switch of, of the interests. Then, once the, once the war was over, the Bada in particular started to revise the value of Hubble's constant. First of all, it came down to 250. Then it came down to 180. When I started doing cosmology, I was stuck with 180. But uh, over the next uh, few years, it came down to values between 100 and 50 kilometers per second per megabar parsec. And once you've got these values, then, of course, 1 over h naught becomes 
10 to 20 billion years, which is comfortably bigger than the age of the Earth. And everybody, we all breathe a sigh of relief and say, thank goodness we can throw out the cosmological constant again. We don't need it anymore. Right? Uh, and because it was difficult enough to measure anything at that stage. If you knew anything in cosmology within a factor of 10, you were doing well. So uh, this was one less problem that you had to, uh, had, had to deal with. Then in the early 1960s, the mass of helium in the universe began to be measured. And it was indeed found that where you could measure it, it was also coming up, uh, up, up about 23%. Uh, and that's much more than could be created by stellar nuclear synthesis. Now, amazingly, uh, this, pro this pro pro problem was raised in a lecture course in Cambridge that I attended in 1964 by Hoyle and Taylor. And Fred Hoyle he, he would come in each day, I'm going to talk about extragalactic astronomy, he said. I'm going to talk about that. And we're going to deal with the helium problem this week. And we didn't know what the helium problem was. And he went through all the, the data then, and then redid the calculations uh, that had been done by Gamow after the war. But now Roger Taylor had just come back from the from Cullum Laboratory and had all better cross sections for neutrino interactions and everything else that you need to do the sums. And in the next three lectures, they worked out in real time the modern theory. It was absolutely fabulous. You, know, you need luck. And it was luck to be there to actually see that all happening in, in real time. Well, they got to the answer, the, which is well known, that you not only, you, you can produce 25% uh, by mass, but also you get traces of the lighter elements as well, which are created in primordial nuclear synthesis. So this is showing the predictions, predicted abundance of the heavy elements, uh, of the lots of light elements for different mean densities of the universe today. And you can see there's quite a range. We can put on that the observed values, for these abundances, and you can see that for a low value of the mean density of the universe now, you can account uh, very well for the observed abundances of, you can see them here, deuterium, helium-3, and lithium-7, as well as helium-4. But that figure as we, uh, is, is significantly less than the critical density. So one's still roughly a factor of 50 below the critical density for the amount of these light elements. And that was all understood by the late uh, 1960s. Then in 1965, the great discovery of the cosmic microwave background took place. And this goes again, one of these accidental discoveries that Penzias and Wilson were not looking for this radiation. They were simply calibrating uh, their, their, their horn antenna in order to be able to do molecular line, line astronomy. But what they discovered was that wherever they looked on the sky, there was background radiation with temperature about 3 degrees Kelvin. And that was the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And the most recent observations of the spectrum is from the COBE spectrum from the 1990s. Here's the, spec here's the spectrum here. And the error bars are much smaller than the size of the dots. It's the most perfect black body spectrum in the universe. Here are the residuals, in, in, again, relative to this, showing you, again, the very, very how, how, how perfect a black body it is. So the best black body we've got is up there in the sky. Now, uh, let's just then, then, then look at what, what has happened si since. I'm going to show you some pictures of the whole sky. And what we do is to do exactly what we do in one of these Eithoff hammer projections of, of the Earth. You just take the surface of the sphere and project it onto this two-dimensional sheet of paper. You can see that you get all sorts of distortions away from the, from, from the plane, but you've got to just bear with it. You can't do it any other way. So. What I'm going to show you now are the modern pictures of the Kobe maps of the sky, which was again produced in the early 1990s. Now, this picture I'm going to show you to me is one of the most startling, beautiful pictures in the whole of astronomy and cosmology. And uh, there it is. That's it. <laughs> That's it. And that picture is, is fabulous, utterly, utterly fabulous. And, and, and any cosmologist will always say, thank God for that. If we didn't have this perfect isotropy, then we would have to start off with extremely complicated, anisotropic, horribly mis mixed up model, instead of which we've got that. <laughs> and it's telling us that on the large scale, 
when you look in one direction, the universe is the same as in other directions. And therefore, it simplifies the equations. It means the simple Friedman models can be applied with large confidence on the large scale in, in the universe. If you go down a factor of, uh, of a thousand in, in intensity, then you begin to get recover the plane of the galaxy here. That is the plane of the galaxy um, that we live in. And you see this dipole distribution of radiation. And this is another beautiful example of the Doppler effect where we are moving through the frame of reference in which the sky will be completely isotropic. It's a perfect cosine distribution across the sky. That tells us our local systemic velocity relative to the frame of reference in which the microwave background uh, would be uh, completely isotropic. If you were about special relativity, ask me in special time, in, in, in question time, there's no problem. Okay. We, we are in a, in a cosmologically preferred frame of reference. And then when we go down another factor of 100, uh, we recover the plane of the galaxy here in, the, in these copy images. Uh, we are not interested in the galaxy, so there's the plane of the galaxy. Say, good, we've got it back, and we blank it out. But the ripples at the high latitude, these are only about one part in a hundred thousandth of the total intensity, but these are genuinely cosmological ripples of the earliest phases of galaxy formation that we can actually see. Now, where is that radiation coming from? Well, it is coming from this epoch here. This is the temperature history of the universe. And this is, again, just the sort of adiabatic expansion that we heard about in another con context. All that's happening is you're expanding the wavelength of all the, f of all, all the photons or the light. And that is basically what's happening as the universe cools. That radiation must have been much hotter in, in the past. So it hits around about 4,000 Kelvin here. And then, earlier, all of the matter and radiation in the universe is going to be ionized. So you've got a photon barrier here, and that's where the ripples come from. The ri ripples are imprinted on that epoch of what we call the epoch of recombination at a redshift of around about a thousand. So uh, here is where these ripples come from. Uh, here is us uh, on Earth here, and when we look at the microwave background, we're looking at this surface, and that surface occurred around about 370,000 years after the Big Bang. So you've got the opportunity of studying very early times in the universe uh, relative to where we are now. Now, uh, before I go any further, let me make a point. This is a fantastic piece of incredible luck because these are very tiny ripples and therefore all the physics is linear. Right? It means you can do the sums absolutely perfectly, exactly, accurately. Right? And therefore, that's why we put such a heavy weight upon these cosmological arguments. The physics, provided we write down all the equations right and solve them correctly, are linear, solu soluble physics. So that is very, very good news. Now, the only trouble about uh, the universe so far is that we don't have any structure in it. Right? We've got a perfectly beautiful isotropic universe. And the big question is, how do we make you and me? Where do we fit into the picture? Well, to begin with, we've got to make the galaxies and then make the stars in the galaxies. But Lemaitre and Tolman, in 1934, carried out the analysis of the development of spherical perturbations in an otherwise uniform universe. So take a little bit of universe and make it slightly denser. Then this little region here will be ex behave exactly like a universe of higher density. And that's what I'm showing here. Here's the critical model here. Enhance the density of that little region, and then it becomes a closed universe, and there's its dynamics. So we've solved everything. And you can see immediately one important thing about this picture, and that is that the growth is not exponential. The growth is only corresponding to the divergence of these two lines here, and that is the key aspect in the whole story of galaxy formation in, on the large scale. To put it, uh, put it uh, in terms of, uh, this is not too technical, that the way in which the density perturbation increases is just proportional to the scale factor or the size of the universe. Right? So between the year epoch of recombination at a redshift of 1,000 and now, the universe expands by a factor of 1,000. Therefore, what that tells you is that you must have fluctuations on that last scattering surface about one part in a thousandth or you will not make structures today. So that is one of the key things, and that's what the models have got to do. In the 1930s, 
they used this argument to say that galaxies could not have been formed by gravitational collapse because you had to put in large, very large, finite perturbations or else you would not make it. So one of the big challenges, where did these come from? Now, I'm going to uh, skip over lots of the details. Uh, after, the, uh, after the microwave background was discovered, there's a huge upsurge of interest in developing these models. Uh, the Moscow School with Zeldovich and his students, Novikov, Dorishkevich, Sunyaev. I was very fortunate enough to spend a year in Moscow in exactly the right time working with these guys in understanding the cosmological models. And then the Princeton School was being led by Jim, Jim Peoples. So they showed very early, in particular Igor Novikov, uh, showed that perturbations had to be of the order one part in, in a 10,000 to make sure that you would gal make galaxies now. So these are not infinitesimal perturbations. You've got to have a physical mechanism for putting in uh, large perturbations at the beginning. Now, what then do you have to explain? Well, I'll show you some uh, pictures of the very large scale structure now of galaxies. That's where the matter has actually ended up in the universe once the galaxies are formed. So this is a schematic diagram showing what uh, Margaret Geller and, uh, and John Hooker did. They measured the distances of all the galaxies in this sort of uh, cone-shaped region and discovered this picture. Now, this is in our locality, only going out to quite small redshifts, but we are at the center, and if the galaxies were uniformly distributed throughout the universe, then the points would be randomly scattered on this picture. You would not see this structure if the galaxies were randomly distributed. And you can see very clearly that that is not the case. We've got things like what we call the great voids. Here's a great void here, and this is a structure on the scale Oh, far exceeding a cluster of galaxies, there's no way in which this can be formed by, at the present epoch by gravitational f f forces. You've got to put in the, the seed structure which is going to make that happen. And likewise, uh, we've got these things that are called the great walls. You see this great structure here? That, there's no way in which that can actually form under gravity alone. You've got to put in the initial structure to get that right. So these are key things that we have to put into our model. Here's uh, what happens when we go further out, going five times further out. You will see that this hole and void structure persists out as far as we can see the universe at the, at the present day. So it's something which has got to be explained. Where the, what I'd call the standard dark matter picture came from, came in the early 1980s. Because what was happening is that the measurements of the ripples in the background radiation were being pushed further and further down. We'll come back to this in a moment. And they were becoming in conflict with the predictions of the standard model. And by 1980, the predictions were exceeding the observational limits, and so something was needed to patch up the models. Well, there were various suggestions made, but the one which actually has survived and is the one that we all use is that Peebles, Bond, and others suggested that the you would reduce the amplitude of the perturbations if the dark matter with a very small interaction cross-section with the ordinary matter in the universe dominated the dynamics of the universe. And that's the most precise way of defining what we mean by dark matter. It's stuff which has got extremely small interaction cross-section with ordinary matter, and, uh, but it does dominate the dynamics of the universe. And this very, very rapidly became the preferred model. So what this meant was that in the early 1980s, we now got two invisible components of the universe. The dark matter, which had been around uh, since, since uh, Einstein and De Sitter's time, but now had to have a very small interaction cross-section because of these problems. And then the dark energy, which was the lambda term. And that's then become more or less the standard uh, paradigm for the way in which we build models of the universe. So uh, let's go to the standard model and see how it works. What we're saying is that the models are going to be dominated by dark matter and dark energy, and we're going to call these dens their density parameters uh, omega m for the mass uh, dark matter and omega lambda for that associated with the dark energy. We've got to put in an initial spectrum of perturbations, or else we won't end up with structure now. And so what people do is to put in the simplest possible power spectrum, something which looks like this. This is just defining the noise properties of the, of the input spectrum. Just a power law in, in wave number k with n equals 1. It, it's the simplest possible thing that you could do with random phases. Now, I have to say that that 
did not come out of a vacuum. I was there in Moscow when I saw Zeldovich do it. Right? And what he did was to take all the observations, take them back to the, to, to, the, to the epoch of recombination, and then say, what line will go through these data that will guarantee that I make galaxies now? And the answer was n equals 1. So this is not a theoretical prediction. This is one by looking at the data and saying, uh, what, do we, uh, what do we need? Then the ordinary baryonic matter has density of parameter omega b, which is only about 1 to 5% of the total dark, uh, dark matter density. So these are the typical inputs that you put in to our present uh, standard models of the universe. So uh, let, let, let's have a look and see what happens. So these are the things that we put in, and then we see if we can make the universe as we see it now. So uh, if we run the next simulation, it's going to be in what we call co-moving coordinates. So what that means is I've taken out the expansion of the universe. Take that out and just look at what happens to one box of material as you let the universe go under gravity with these uh, various input parameters. And we're going to go, be going from round about when the universe was a hundredth of its present age to the, to the present time. So there it is there. Now this again is in co-moving coordinates, so it'll say the same size. Remember, you've got to superimpose the expansion of the universe on top of it. We've got the power spectrum put in, and that gives us these little ripples there. So let's now just run it and see what happens. This is part of the Virgo simulations, coming from the universe a hundredth of its present age to the present. And this is purely gravity doing the driving. And it's rather pretty, right? Now, this is only gravity with a pure power law spectrum, input uh, spectrum of perturbations. And you will see that that essentially automatically produces this large stringy structure, the hole and void pattern that we see. This is all in the dark matter. You know, we, we're not around. This is what happens to the dominant dark matter, which is the dominating, gravitating thing. It's, it's present in the universe. I think that's wonderful. So what we've made is a cluster of galaxies in the middle with this large-scale structure here. Now, as I said, that is in the dark matter and therefore provides the structure into which the ordinary matter that you and I are made of is going to fall and make ordinary galaxies. So you now want to put in what comes from the ordinary galaxies. So let's see what happens next. Now, here's the next simulation where you take that central panel of that last diagram and now say, let's put the ordinary baryonic matter that we are made of into the same simulation and see what happens. Okay? And what we've got in this panel is the dark matter density, we've got the gas density, we've got the gas temperature, and then the gas shocks. Don't bother about these panels. These are other things which I will answer questions about in the end, but just concentrate on these ones there. The dark matter density, which we've seen already, then the gas densities and the temperature and the gas shocks are now the baryonic matter, which is falling, uh, falling along for the ride. So if we set this one going now, now it, it takes a little while to get going, but you'll see that the gas is falling into the structures which are being Pro provided by the dark matter. This is just ordinary matter falling under the influence of the dark matter. Notice that the gas temperature is getting hot and is becoming much more extensive. Remember that we're going to form a, a cluster of galaxies about here, so this is showing how the gas now falls in to make one of these giant clusters of galaxies. So here are the shocks. They've got the effect of, again, you'll see the, you'll see the galaxies just zooming through the hot gas in some of these, these parts of the simulation. What you're doing here is just using the, the, sh the, the shocks to be able to even out the temperature, heat, heat up the gas. So we're now down to the universe, which is just around about a third of its present age. It's coming down to around about half of its present age about now. And you will see that we've made the cluster of galaxies. Here, we've got the gas density concentrating in the center of the cluster. We've got the hot gas with the galaxies beetling through it, heating up with their shock waves. And we've got these shocks, again, evening out the temperature. Isn't this wonderful? The good news is I've given a copy of all of this. 
to go on the website. But don't distribute it, okay? Just look at, look, look at it and enjoy. But there's huge amounts of very, very beautiful physics going on in there. Now, I could let it run for the other four minutes, but I shall get into terrible trouble with my chairman. So I will, I, 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 I will move on, right? Now, uh, that's the basic picture that we have, and now we want to look and see, can we test that picture? Does it look right in terms of the observations we can make? Now, I'll just show you one example here from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is a three-month exposure with the Hubble Space Telescope on one tiny little region. So we're looking very far back now. Uh, we're looking so far back indeed that we're looking out to round up redshift of 6 to 10, which means we're earlier than a tenth the present age of the universe, right? So that, then you can ask questions. Do the simulations uh, reproduce what we see in that picture? So uh, this is, if you want to see how to find the Hubble Deep Field, here's what you do. So there you'll recognize uh, Orion here. So this is a, a, a very wide angle view, but we will start now zooming in on the various large telescope surveys so we come to this patch, now we switch over to another deep survey in this area here. We've got there, that's not deep enough yet. So we go to the next one, we go to GEMS. We go to the region where there's nothing. You want a region of the sky which has got as little as possible. And then ultimately you've got come to this area here, and this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, where there's nothing, until, unless you integrate for this very, very long time. And now, just look and see what there is on this picture. These are the galaxies when the universe was about a tenth of its present age. And you will see that they don't look like galaxies at the present time. There's very large numbers of blue objects, lots of very tiny objects, lots of very, very disturbed objects, quite different from the rather quiescent universe that we see now. And this is exactly what you expect. 
The process of galaxy formation that you saw was one of bringing together small things to make big things. And that's the way that the models work. And we're actually seeing this happening in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So this has become one of the most exciting areas of modern cosmology, trying to disentangle exactly what happened in images like this in the detailed way in which the first galaxies were formed. And that's where a huge amount of effort is being de devoted at the moment. Now, the other great prediction of the theories was that there should be these ripples in the cosmic microwave background radiation with a very particularly well-defined power spectrum. Now, I, I wish your students could learn about power spectra because they are so wonderful things, right? You just take this random distribution of stuff, Fourier transform it, and then you will get from that the amount of power on a particular wavelength. And it's the way in which technically you can actually describe these things. So this is showing just the power on the sky in angular degrees, 10 degrees, 1 degree, 0.1 degree. And what Kobe did when we looked at that very early picture in the early 1990s, it defined this bit of the spectrum really rather beautifully. This is what Kobe did. But the key prediction of the theories was that there should be these peaks, these acoustic peaks, uh, at angular scales of around about one degree. Now, you may ask, where do these come from? Where does that signature come from in the, in, in the cosmological models? Well, um, see one of my other books that's not here. <laughs> on galaxy formation. Very good book, right? Uh, so uh, and there I try to explain as physically, using simple physics, where these come from. But the simplest way of looking at it is to look at these, uh, the, here are the peaks draw on, on their side here. And what's happening is here's the horizon scale when the, when the whole size of the visible universe is equal to the size of the perturbation. Right? When they come through the horizon, then they start to collapse here. Uh, in, this, in this case, I'm, I'm going to allow them to, this is, there's time for the, uh, the response of the medium to make them sound waves. So they start collapsing here. A smaller scale will have come through earlier through the horizon. We'll have time to collapse to a high density and produce the first peak. On an even smaller scale, you've got time for it to go all the way through to produce a rare affection there, and you get that point. And then the next maximum corresponds to this earlier one coming through, collapsing to high density, going. Uh, coming large, and then coming out to a, ma a maximum rarefaction here, which gives you that one. So does that make any sense? That's what happens. And it's on the slides, and you can ponder it. That's where they come from. It's all the timing of when the fluctuations on large scales come through their cosmological horizons. Now, uh, the, uh, I think you've all seen the fantastic results that have come out of the ESA Planck mission, and the cosmological results were just presented earlier this, this year. Now, here's the Planck sky as observed. This is, it, the thing about the Planck uh, experiment, it, it's the, essentially the ultimate measurement of the cosmic microwave background radiation, done in nine separate frequency bands, so that you can take out all the interfering signals which are present in this picture and leave the pure, unadulterated cosmological background uh, ripples there. Now, it says at the bottom, uh, run video. So I'll show you what's got to be done to this map to clean it up and see the cosmological uh, uh, signals. So if my system works, I go to there, right? And now this is an ESA uh, little video showing you what the teams had to do to be able to create the map of the background radiation. You've got to get rid of all the interfering foreground components. So uh, let's see if this, uh, if this will work. So uh, he, 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 here's all the advertising uh, material. But here, you've got to get rid of individual sources the radio emission from the Milky Way, the dust emission from the gal galaxy, and then leave the microwave background. So you first of all catalog all the sources, you take them off, and that will then leave you only the radio emission from the Milky Way, which you then model by the, for, from, from, from the various information you got, strip that off, you're left with the dust emission at high frequencies, so you need to take off from a dust model, you take that one off too, and you're left with that. 
So there's a lot of foreground work, very, very careful calibration work to be made, sure that this all works. So that's the picture that you will have seen in the newspapers, justly very, very famous. Now, that is beautiful in itself, but the thing which is really startling, which I love, is a picture which never gets shown. But I'll show you this picture because it's just so important. Uh, let's go back to where we were before. We'll go back to there. Oops. That's not me. Right. So that's the image that we've ended up by when we strip off all these foregrounds. Now, let me show you this picture, uh, which is really absolutely staggering. Now, there were two teams which built the instruments for the, for the Planck satellite. An Italian team did the low frequencies and a French team did the high frequencies. I was the chair of the various committees that had to make these people talk to each other. This was a challenge. Right? because each of them were regarding it as a matter of national prestige, right? that they wanted to do their thing on their own. Now, the good news was that there were maps made at very close frequencies, 100 gigahertz and 70 gigahertz. And we were trying to persuade them all the way through to share the software, share experience, but no, they said, we're going to do it properly our own way. Right? We don't trust these guys. We don't trust these guys. We will do it our own way, using our own guys. So what they did, they were allowed to exchange data, but they were not allowed to, they didn't use the same reduction procedures. They developed them both separately. And then they got the final maps that you received, and then they subtracted them. And this is the subtracted map. Right? Now, what you see here, this, all this red stuff in the galactic plane, that's carbon monoxide because there's a carbon monoxide line which lies in one of the frequency bands, in a higher frequency band. And so you expect that to be present. But if you look away from the plane, this is pure random noise. Pure random noise. It's absolutely fantastic. If you can think of the number of differences in the two reduction, uh, reduction procedures, it means they both got it absolutely right. And this is the sort of thing which you know, I love because it means that we've got an independent determination that the maps are correct. There's no way in which this would happen if there was something wrong with one of the others. So it really is, uh, it means that these observations, these are really heritage images. You know, we're never going to do better than this. It's absolutely fantastic. So that's uh, what we get. That's what we get from these maps. It really is uh, an absolutely wonderful example of, of what Europe, Europe can do in space. And again, European Space Agency is responsible for organizing all this. So here's the power spectrum. And what we've got here is one of the models uh, going through all the points. You can barely see the error bars on there. But you know, if that does not make your heart bleed, you have got no soul. All right? <laughs> you know, this is pure beauty in science. You know, this is the predictor. It's a six-parameter model which fits perfectly all of, these, uh, all of these data in the power spectrum. So the thing is, the, an extraordinary thing is the excellent agreement with the simplest of the lambda CDMM models. The models have got the lambda, they've got the dark, 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 dark matter, dark energy, and so forth. So that's very good. But here's something that blows my mind even more, or as much as that. They were able to do something which I had not thought was possible with the data. And that is to use the gravitational lensing of the microwave background itself to work out where the huge lumps which are doing these perturbations occur in the universe. It's very, very clever. In its simplest way, if you want to know how they did it, you use the four-point correlation function. Right? So it means you've got two points here, which are being correlated with the power spectrum, but you then correlate it with near neighboring points to find out whether they have been distorted relative to where they ought to have been for a random distribution. And you're then able to work out the impact of the gravitational lensing on the large scale structure. So that, the importance of that is it gives us a completely new handle on the way in which we can actually constrain the cosmological parameters. It's absolutely beautiful. And of course, this is the sort of thing which will be done by the Euclid satellite. It will also be looking at these perturbations. I will, I will, I will do it in five minutes.
And here's the map of, the, uh, of large scale uh, density perturbations. This is all in the dark matter which have come out of these. This is not as well known as the other pictures, but to me, this is absolutely stunning, showing the distribution of dark matter on the very, very large scale. And it's correlated with things you can actually see in the universe. Well, here are the cosmological parameters. Uh, here are the six parameter fit, fit, fit to everything. And again, you can see that we're done with real precision cosmology, cosmology now. And it's really uh, absolutely fabulous. These are, these are this is what one can call precision cosmology. When I started doing cosmology, as I said, if you knew anything within a factor of 10, you were overjoyed. Now we're talking about uh, fractions of a percent uh, for many of the key cosmological parameters. Well, uh, the, the, the result of all of this is, uh, we was shown by Paul, uh, here are the, uh, the dominance of the dark energy, the dark matter, and then the ordinary matter only making up less than 5% of the, of, of the total. Now, of course, obviously, the big challenge is what are the dark matter and what are the dark energy? And the answer is, of course, that the, the dark matter is a hard problem, all right? You know, it's a hard problem. There are experiments going on just now to try to detect the dark matter particles in these deep mines in Gran Sasso and in the United States. Uh, and I th they, they're getting to the levels where I think they should be detecting something. So do keep a watch on the newspapers. I would guess within the next five years it's going to be found. That's my guess. But I'm just guessing, all right? I might well be totally wrong. Right? But the dark energy is very hard. Now, now, when someone like me says very hard, that uh, essentially means impossible. But, uh, but you've got to think of the clever, clever ways in which we could actually detect it. Now, the reason it's so hard is it only makes its appearance felt on the very larger scales in the universe. Remember that the gravity goes as 1 over r squared, but the lambda term is going proportional to r. So it only makes its effect felt on the very, very largest scales in the universe. So that's why it's tough. Now, again, all the other independent estimates of the cosmological parameters are now consistent with, uh, with these estimates. And I'll just show you the one example that, again, Paul mentioned. Here's the use of the type 1a supernova remnants. And so here are the super supernovae. Here is the standard version going beautifully through, the, through all the points here, then the other models are, again, not such a good fit. I'm bound to say that a lot of attention has been devoted to this in the Bell Prizes uh, given for this. Uh, I find the cosmic microwave background much more convincing. You know, it's absolutely thousands of sigma. This is, this is not quite thousands of sigma, but it's, it's a jolly good, uh, it's a jolly good uh, estimate. So, there's lots more things to be done uh, to understand what's going on. And just the list of these things here, uh, let me just skip ahead to say that there are various solutions to these, uh, these, these parameters. And I won't go through this list here. Um, the, there's things like the anthropic cosmological principle. The inflation scenario looks very promising. Uh, but then there's something else that we haven't thought of. This is the, the, what I call the Donald Rumsfeld cosmological model, the unknown unknowns cosmological. <laughs> Almost certainly that the real answer is something we haven't been clever enough to think about yet in the models. But we'll, 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 we'll see what will happen. Now, uh, the inflation model is looking very, very promising. And one of the key results uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Planck mission, this is the standard Big Bang with the temperature going down like this, and then we've got the scale factor of the universe growing up like this. Now, that's the, uh, that's the model which, again, uh, will, uh, will not produce the sorts of structures that we see in the universe. So the inflation scenario puts in an, a, a period here when the universe inflated exponentially in the very, very early universe, and then ends up with a universe which is uniform on the very, very largest scale. Now, one of the other key results that's come out of the Planck mission is you can also predict the spectrum of the perturbations which would come out of that due to quantum fluctuations in the, in the early universe. And the answer is that, to everybody's surprise, it's turned out that the quantum fluctuations in the inf uh, which are generated at the end of the inflation era end up being 
very, very close to the sort of spectrum that we need to explain the microwave background radiation. And the new results show that it's not precisely this result, but slightly smaller exponent, which is exactly what many of the generic theories of inflation uh, 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 um, suggest. So this is a way in which this is a, a beautiful bit of in reinforcing evidence that the inflation picture is a good thing. Now, I'm going to skip all of that. Here, uh, then, is the future. This is what we're uh, going to be looking for just in the last few slides, just to show you some of the facilities that will excite the young people. Right? Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is the next uh, big uh, telescope to go up. Uh, it's a diffraction-limited 6.5-metre uh, telescope, primarily operating in the near-infrared wave band. It's one to two microns is its best uh, uh, um, region of operation. And the reason for that is that the galaxies we're going to be looking at are so far away that all of the energy distribution is redshifted into the infrared wave band. So the galaxies that you look at with this are all going to be infrared objects. Um, and so the, it's a fabulous uh, uh, machine. Uh, I'm on the science working group of this, uh, of this thing, and we're expecting it's going to be 2018. So he, the young people will have to hang around a little while till they see the first results, but it should be absolutely uh, terrific when, when it happens. Uh, it, it's, it's going very well, except for the money. So that's, uh, <laughs> uh, that's it. And then uh, there's the European Extremely Large Telescope, uh, which again is, 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 is again in the development stage, a 39-metre optical infrared telescope. Again, the emphasis is on the infrared because of the need to be able to study the very dis distant universe. But there's huge numbers of things that you can do uh, with uh, this sort of thing. This is a very large, very expensive uh, telescope, but you know, the European Southern Observatory is designed to do things like that. We've got the ESA Euclid mission, which is going to try to uh, study evidence for the nature of the cosmological constant for the dark energy by doing very accurate measurements of the distances of galaxies by two different methods. And these will enable us to limit deviations from the standard parameters of general relativity if they exist. And that requires dealing with samples of three billion galaxies observed from space with perfect imaging. It's a real, real challenge. But this will give a huge uh, 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 amount of new information about, about the universe. We've got the Square Kilometre Array, a radio, uh, a radio uh, project. Uh, one square kilometre meaning that's the filled aperture of the total telescope system. It's filled one square kilometre. So there's lots of space in between, but the actual collecting area is going to be one square kilometre. And that will be able to uh, we study the epoch of reionization, get uh, high redshifts out the redshift of two, be able to do all of these standard uh, cosmological tests, but now doing them in the radio wave band. So it's a very exciting project. It has been now selected that one part will go to South Africa, one part will go to Australia. The nice thing for me is that my first two graduate students were Bernard van der Roff, uh, and Julia Riley, and then when I was in Edinburgh, I, I taught Brian Boyle. Brian Boyle and Bernard van der Roff are the leaders of the ISKA in South Africa and in Australia. So I might get some observing time if I, if I live to see it built. That, 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 that's the thing. So uh, uh, the first bit should be finished about uh, 20, 2020 would be, be good, and then the second part by 2024 or so. We've got advanced uh, telescopes for high energy astrophysics. This is one of the uh, European Space Agency's projects, testing general relativity in the strong field limit, I regard as being one of the most exciting areas that is going on there, both for, uh, both for local objects and for distant active galaxies. We've got the new gravitational wave observatory. This used to be called, called LISA. Uh, but uh, when the Americans pulled out uh, of, of, of the joint project, it had to be redesigned to do this. And again, the redesign is going on, and it's, it's, it's a fantastic uh, project to detect gravitational waves from things like uh, coalescing black holes in the centers of galaxies. And so this is, again, opening up a whole new window of opportunities for totally original researchers. And then there's no reason now why we can't be even more ambitious and think about this thing called at last which is an advanced technology large aperture space telescope. In principle, you could build something like this if you've got something like Anari's five launch vehicle. You could actually put that up. 
So uh, the, 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 the final message is uh, these are uh, fantastically exciting times, very wonderful for the young people to know that we can actually ask these very, very difficult questions and hope to be able to give good physics answers to them. So uh, the future is, is very bright and expensive. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.